Good evening, everybody. And as Gerard said, organics is definitely a very big buzzword at the moment. And as he said, I've been working in the area in 15 years. And I think in the last 15 months, there's a real momentum going there. So what I want to talk about is, I'm very lucky I have Amy he with me tonight. I'm just going to give a kind of a, an introduction to organics, where we're at the moment and where we're hoping it'll go. And then I just a couple of, um, I suppose, pointers in relation to you as a, as a sheep farmer, what kind of considerations you have to think about inside the farm gate. And then I'm going to have Amy, will, I'll hand over to Amy and she'll put the meat on it and the reality of those few points that I make. So in a short time, we'll try and cover as much as we can. Okay. Where are we at? Organic land area. If we look at big picture, and big picture is Europe. And presently in Europe, right across Europe, there's 9.1% of the land area being farmed organically. We've all heard about the EU Green Deal, farm to fork, from there stating that by 2030, we want, the aim is to have 25% of the land being farmed organically. And if you put it in context, that's one field in four. So one field in four to be organic by 2030. Where we're at at the moment is we, as Ger alluded to, in a new scheme opened up just before Christmas, and we had two, over 2,000 new entrants into that new scheme, and they were joining an existing 2,000. So we have 4,000 farmers now farming organically, and 2,000 starting the conversion to organic. So there has been a huge upsurge, and these numbers again, the scheme will be all going to plan. Will open again towards the end of the year. So again more ambitious, we're hoping that more will go in at that stage. But that's where we stand at the moment. If you were to look at wh what are those 4,000 farmers farming, it's pro predominantly uh, livestock production. And last figure showed, looking at the sheep side alone, that we had about 66,000 ewes uh, in, in approximately 700 flocks. If we look at the area of, the f of being farmed, I said we're now at just o over 3%. Between three and four percent, we're talking about 190,000 hectares. So our aim, and the aim of the President's government target, is to align us with the EU average presently of 9.1 percent. So that's where that's where the aim is to go. Oh, I went backwards. Apologies. So, in relation to, from a policy point of view, and from. Uh, a scheme point of view, and again mentioning the scheme that Ger mentioned, the organic farming scheme is a five-year scheme. The, actually, the organic uh, unit of the Department of Agriculture is actually based here in, in Wexford, in Johnstown Castle. And they have a five-year scheme, and here, just to show you what actually, it's an area-based payment. We we'll just look at the dry stock here, if I can point her. The payment rate is 300 euros per hectare for year one and two, coming down to uh, 250 in year three, four, and five. So maybe you're wondering, why is there year one, two, and year three, five? When your farm enters conversion to organics, it takes two years for your land to get full organic status. So your land is undergoing organic conversion in year one and two. So hence you get a higher rate payment because you have no organic produce until the first 24 months have elapsed. Then in year three, four and five, you're at 250 euros per hectare. On top of that is a participation payment on top of your areas payment of in the first year of 2,000 euro and then in year uh, two, three, four, and five, that comes down to 1,400 euro uh, per year. Again, you wonder what was the participation payment? I suppose we're all used to applying for schemes like, for example, Acres, you went into a planner and you, you sent your, pay, your scheme application into the Department of Agriculture. In organics, it's slightly different. As I said, you have the HQ of the Department of Organic Unit in Johnstown Castle in Wexford, but they've given the role or designated what's called organic certification bodies to inspect you as an organic farmer through your participation in the organic farming scheme. So naturally, 
those certification bodies will have to be paid every year. So this will help towards, for example, the payment of uh, your, your certification fee on an annual basis, or even also if, you're, if you have an advisor. So that's what this participation payment will help with. I just put up here, just very quickly, selling it with total amounts here. 40 hectare sheep farm in year one will get 14,000, in year two, 13,400, in year three uh, to five, 11,400. So that's what the money is worth. But let's move on in relation to, it's not all about money. You have to do something to get this money. So we need to think about, sometimes as I say to people when I'm talking to them about organics and convert, converting to organics, is that you have to, the land is the easy part to convert, but you need to convert yourself first. So you need to know and know what organics is about. Backwards again. As I said, I'm, I've said this already, just in relation to converting to organics, a lot of people think, well, how long does it take? So two years, in conversion, that's the terminology that you use, and then your farm is fully converted after two years, and your produce is full organic status then. As I've mentioned before, the organic unit is based in Johnstown Castle. They've given the role of the, of the inspections to the organic certification bodies. In Ireland, you have two certification bodies, the Irish Organic Association and the Organic Trust. So, We'll park that for a minute now and let's look at what type of things do you need to be thinking about when you're considering converting to organics. We've just picked four areas I just want to touch on. Breeding, flock health, diet and housing. So breeding. Breeding is no different than what you're doing already in relation to organic farmers and it was just touched on with Dave in his closing. In relation to what tie crossbred yo fits very well into the system. Organic farmers would tend to look and check breeds that have a tolerance to worms. So for example, Texel would be, blood would be included there as, as somebody in the audience said, and also you'd have a good lean carcass. Bell clear is also would be another consideration because they would also have Texel blood. Suffolk, if you're looking for uh, an early uh, lamb, would be considered. So any of those crossbred with anything like a Shirley, Suffolk, Texel will produce a good quality lamb. In relation to maybe replacing breeding stock, the considerations are slightly different when an organic farmer, you can't just go out and buy a nice pen of breeding yews. In organics, the ideal would be to have a closed flock system. That would be the ideal. You'd be minimizing bringing in diseases and your flock would be closed. However, in reality, that may not be the case. So what you would look for, if you could not find organic breeding sheep, breeding females to suit your system, you can get permission from your certification body to buy in 20% of your adult flock. So if I had 200 joes and I needed to get replacements, I couldn't get them organically, it would be 20% of 200 joes is what I could bring in with permission from the certification bodies. No a uh, problem in relation to the buying a ram, you do not have to source an organic ram, so you can buy a ram from a non-organic herd. Moving quickly on to flock health, again it's a big question that I get asked by farmers on a day-to-day -day basis. Some people think if you go organic, it's natural, that's it, that's, you don't treat sick animals. You will do no differently than what you're doing today. If you've got a sick animal or sick sheep in the morning, you go out and you treat that sick animal because animal health and welfare is one of the key principles and a key ethos in organic farming. There are considerations, having said that, that you will try, you will, your aim is to have a healthy and productive sheep, but you will try and maybe use more management practice. So we're looking at clean grazing, maybe looking at, I'll be talking a little bit about in, in diets, multi-species swarts, uh, forage crops, all of that kind of thing, you man, uh, clean grazing, rotational grazing. You will aim to try and, and place great emphasis on that. However, when you go into organics, you put together a flock health plan, and Amy will go through it with her on her farm in relation to what a flock health plan con uh, consists of. You sit down with your veterinary surgeon, you put it together, and you would put together um, on an annual basis what you would be treating for. So if you are vaccinating now, 
you would put that in on your plant and you can continue vaccinating. If you, there's a mineral deficiency on the farm, you would put that in and you would continue with your mineral uh, treatments. If you have, um, are treating needs, there is a, a, a fluke warm parasite problem on the farm, it's identified and that would be put in the animal health plan. I suppose, again, looking at what differences maybe in relation to organic uh, sheep farming and any animal farming in organics, there will be longer withdrawal times that you have to, to adhere to. So, so if the bottle says X number of days in organics, it'll be twice what's written on the bottle. That's what, it, what the difference is. Also, I have here a number of treatments within 12 months also. Now, I put that up in Mon and, and people thought the fluke and worm treatments and that is included there in vaccinations. That's not the case. Here, if I went out and I had a, a sick lamb or an outbreak of something in the herd, I could go in and treat the animals, and it's a veterinary treatment for an illness that we're talking about here. And if an animal is going for meat consumption uh, and is treated more than uh, once in a 12-month period, that lamb c cannot be f uh, sold into the organic food chain. So that's, it can be, the option you have is that you can reconvert it over 15 months, or you can sell it conventionally. Uh, very important, no different than what you're doing, you're all in relation to treatments. You get a record book when you join organics and you record all your treatments. So all your treatments will be recorded. And again, uh, Amy will, will, will talk more about that. Diet, feeding them. Again, first of all, yes, it states that in, in the organic standard, 60% of the diet is from a forage base, grass forage feed basis post weaning. So that's what you're aiming for. Again, um, organic ration, I'll say it straight up, is very expensive. You're talking about, myself and Amy were talking about it, and she'll be talking about, you're talking in the region 800 plus per ton. Okay, that's what it is. That's out there. So what have you to do as an organic sheep farmer to get over that? And Amy will discuss it, but what I would be seeing on farms, and we're in good, a good area here, in relation to tillage, is a mixed enterprise, is to try and, first of all, maximize the grass utilization. I know we're being told that from every facet, but in organics, very important. So you need rotational grazing, you need clean grazing. The whole area of multi-species swarts are showing great, um, having great results. Again, we know there's a lot more research to be done on it, but I would have farmers finishing lambs on, on multi-species swarts. Also, with the multi-species swarts, very good anthelmintic properties, mineral properties are showing very good promise as regards finishing lambs. I would have farmers using forage crops, winter forage crops for the grazing of, of lambs and that. So these are the kind of things that you're going to have to be look at and try and impl implement onto your farm. And there are organic rations and compounds can be, can be found, but we have to look the other way to try and make it work. Finally, housing. Again, you don't have to house animals in organics once when you outwinter, you're cross compliant. In relation to housing and housing here of sheep, what I would say when you're housing sheep, as we talk about here tonight, there's more generous spaces allowed. And what I mean by that, if we look here, I have 1.5 meters squared per head is what a yo requires in total if she's been housed. And 50% of that 1.5, 50% of that 1.5 has to be a solid lie back bedded area. So they can't be on slats all the time. They must have access to uh, a solid lie back bedded area with plenty of straw. Again, we don't have to get far bedding. We don't have enough organic straw, so conventional straw is used for bedding. So on the note of bedding, I'm now going to hand you over, if I don't go backwards again, over to Amy. So she's going to put into practice some of the things I have said. So you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first off, I just want to admit that 
I'm a whole lot more comfortable in a field of sheep than I am stood up here um, tonight talking to all of you. So I'm going to give it my best shot, and look, if you have any questions, if I skip over any bits too fast, um, feel free to ask at the end. So um, I'm farming in North Tipperary with my husband, Ross. We decided to put the farm into organic in May 2015. We entered a two-year organic conversion period, and we were fully certified then in May 2017. Our first organic lamb sales then were in 2018. Um, just this photograph here, it was a, a monumental day. We, we hadn't had any sheep on the farm before this. It was 100% conventional tillage. There were no fences or roadways, no plumbing systems, no, you know, no water troughs. So it was a big deal for us to uh, turn the farm into a sheep farm. Um, and sure, the, the in-laws and my parents and everyone was there to see the first lamb set foot onto the place. Our flock initially was made up of 120 organic crossbred ewe lambs. These were just regular, um, mainly Texel crosses that would have otherwise gone to the factory. Um, found them on Dundeal <laughs> from five different farmers. So I traveled the country um, sourcing our initial flock. We bought, I, I settled on Charolais rams for our terminal rams. Um, they're a nice, lean, uh, meaty carcass, but also uh, for ease of lamb and considering that all of my ewes in the first year were ewe lambs. Um, and then I settled on a border Leicester ram as the maternal sire. Um, I'd had experience of working with border Leicesters in Northumberland in England. Um, big, framey ewe, easy lambed, and highly maternal, which makes my life easier at lambing time when they're well mothered up. So this was our first cross. I don't know if you can follow my, my logic here, um, but we have the original crossbred ewe lambs um, in the middle, and we put those to the board of Leicester Cross to breed our own replacements. So we do have a, a fairly well-closed flock. The only thing that we really buy in is uh, rams, as and when we need to introduce a new ram. And then on the right-hand side here, these are the um, terminal sires, the two Charolais, and they're producing our factory lambs. So in the very beginning, I had no real grasp of star ratings. Um, I just bought the rams based on how they looked, to be honest. Um, and ever since then, I've bought five star rated rams, either maternal or terminal, or both. So then we're on to our second cross. Um, in 2021, before the mating season, I knew that I had to source a new breed of um, maternal ram because all of my flock were border Leicester crosses pretty much. Um, my border Leicester ram was redundant. Either I needed to get out an unrelated border Leicester or change the breed. It was really late at night. One night I was um, reading about all the different breeds and all the merits of the different breeds and my own interest as well is in breeding nicely shaped um, factory lambs. So I, w I decided I was going to improve the confirmation of my breed and ewe, and I was going to use a rouge ram for that. So I'm using a rouge ram now for breeding um, replacements. Oops, sorry. So this is the rouge. Now he has 10 stars altogether, five maternal and five terminal. And the huge benefit of that for me is that I can use him as a maternal sire, but all of the other lambs that are bred by him, say the... Uh, byproduct, if you like, of breeding my own replacements are going to be good factory lambs as well. And that wasn't really the case with the Border Leicester, if I'm honest. Um, I got two Bell Texas as well. One is 10 stars, five on both sides, and the other is nine, um, five star terminal uh, with really good days to slaughter, and then four stars maternal. And I still have the Charolais as well. Um, and so these, now, now we're, we have Charlie Cross, Beltex Cross, and Rouge Cross uh, factory lambs coming through. And then the third cross. So this year I have my Rouge Cross ewe lambs in lamb. Uh, they went to a Beltex ram, the five, some, a handful of them to the five star maternal and the rest to the other terminal rams. I won't keep any ewe lambs off them this year because they're only lambs themselves, and any ewe lambs born off them this year will be late born. They won't be mature enough come mating season. So it'll be next year when I'm keeping my first replacements off these rouge crosses. And that's an aspirational photo in the bottom left. Um, 
this is what I hope they'll look like. Um, some of you might be thinking they're a bit extreme for breeding ewes, but I, the, one of the farms in Northumberland where, where I got most of my experience is breeding these, and he has excellent quality lambs. Um, the lambs bred out of those should achieve maybe a 53 to 57% kill out in the factory. And what that means is I'd be drafting lambs then at 36 kilos to get the maximum pay weight on the carcass, which means they've gone off the grass quicker and it's going to ultimately reduce my feed costs at the end of the day. Um, the factory lambs, of it, they're, they're our current factory lambs, um, but you know, by the time we've added in these lean meaty carcasses, they'll be slightly improved as well. So we, at the moment, we're most likely around the, the U grades. Um, I just have a docket here from the 1st of December. 21 U3s and 9 R3s. Um, average kilo, 21.9, so I nearly got the 22. And 14 of them out of the 30 were at the maximum uh, pay weight, 22 and a half. So this is, these are the kind of things that are driving me. Um, stock and rate, everybody's interested in stock and rate in organic. Um, it's probably slightly below average, but it's fairly average. It's not too bad. We have 167 adult breeding sheep at the moment. And we, our farm is 50 hectares approximately in total, but half of that is in tillage. And it is on a rotational basis, but you know, we, ch we aim to have a 50-50 split tillage versus grassland. So we have 167 adult breeding sheep on 25 hectares of grassland, which translates to 6.68 adult breeding sheep per grassland hectare. And just to mention then as well that um, we do have winter forage crops on our oats and barley uh, ground. So the sheep are grazed on the forage crops th from no November through to January or December if they're gloss uh, fields. So I'm just going to take a sip here. So scanning rates, um, you've probably gathered by now, I kind of like my stats and figures and performance measurements and that kind of thing. So I do um, keep a record of the scanning rates on an individual basis, like I know what each U has bred over all the years. Um, and after 2021, now that 2021 figure was particularly high, um, but it, I've seen a drop then since then. And obviously I was a bit concerned that the type of U I was breeding was causing a reduction in my scanning rate. Um, so I decided to investigate it a little bit. And I plotted the scanning rate by age of sheep. So I've got an average scanning rate there for, and now the age on this chart is the age at lambing time. So they were five months less than that um, when, they went, when they were mated. So the peak there is um, for five-year-old sheep, maximum fertility in, in my flock, this is only data from my flock, um, was at five years old and then reasonable either side, four years old and six years old. And as I said, that's the age at mating, so really, age at breed, age at lambing, so really what you're looking at is a four-year-old going to the ram being um, the most fertile in terms of my flock. And then I said, well, if maximum fertility in my flock is five years old, how many of my sheep are five years old? And as things stand right now, um, the yellow wedge there, is five years old. So I've got a very small proportion of my sheep um, at that peak fertility. And then looking at the, the two age groups either side of that, um, you can see it makes a, a, a quarter of the pie chart is at them sort of higher fertility. So what I'm aiming to do is um, even out the ages of my flock. I want a fairly even slice of this pie to be one year old through to six year old. And then of the three fairly fertile chunks, they'll, instead of making up a quarter of this pie, they'll make up half of it. So that should um, increase my overall scanning rate if my theory's right, <laughs> which it might not be. Could be down to weather conditions, could be down to drought, could be down to body condition score. Um, there's a number of factors. Um, but still, I have an interest in trying to improve it, so I'm looking at what I can. Um, a question on... Uh, Tuesday night was, is it to do with the Border Leicester Cross? And that was a perfectly valid question, and it, is some, it was my initial um, worry as well. So I did have a look at that last night, and I found, I suppose, 
at the end of the day, no, there's not really any big difference. I have moderately prolific originals and moderately prolific border Leicester crosses. And because I'm in organic, moderate, prolific because suits me, because I'm a part-time farmer, if I have loads of um, spare lambs, I'm going to have to rear them on artificial milk, which to my knowledge is going to be non-organic, which means I can't sell them organically. And most likely when they go out into the field, then they're going to be put straight onto meal, which Elaine has already mentioned is very expensive. So um, I just really want each you ideally to go away with two lambs. On to flock health then. Really what we're aiming to do in organic is build resilience in our livestock so that we can reduce the amount of treatments the animals are going to need to get. Um, so this is sort of from the ground upwards. So you're starting off with soil fertility, you're building fertility in the soil. You're growing a range of um, species. We've got multi-species grasslands across the whole farm. We've got red clovers. Um, we've got winter forage crops. And then we're scanning the ewes to make sure that we feed them correctly at lambing time. We have minerals coming up uh, in the fields because of the deep tap roots on the likes of plantain. And we give mineral boluses to the ewes as well, a six-month mineral bolus in August and in February. And the lambs get a four-month mineral bolus when they're weaned. So the big ethos in organic is to avoid blanket tre treating. So like we wouldn't decide there's a worm problem, we go and treat all of the lambs in one go. We do it on an individual case-by-case -case basis. This is what our flock health plan looks like. The flock health plan is drawn up between ourselves and our veterinary consultant. Um, so just starting with August, when you're preparing your ewes for mating, we would give the mineral bolus to the ewes then. The rams go out in October, we're lambing in March, and again that's because of organic, we're coinciding with the grass growth. We scan the ewes then around 80 days gestation, and that usually falls just after Christmas. And then when the ewes are housed, we're giving them their next mineral bolus and their vaccination booster. So the only vaccine we give on our farm is for clostridial diseases and pneumonia. We have had issues with Toxo um, we, in the first year. We didn't vaccinate, and we haven't had any significant issues since. And we did have an outbreak of ORF one year, um, I actually got it myself as well. And we did vaccinate on veterinary recommendation that year, but we haven't done it since and we haven't had a problem since. We're lambing then in March. We lamb all our ewes indoors. Um, it's a solid floor shed, straw bedded, using our own straw. And just, I suppose, two points to note, we're feeding our own silage as well. And some of that will be red clover silage, which is higher protein than the regular silage. And again, that'll reduce um, some of our feed costs because organic soya, I think, is up around the 1,600 or 700 euros a tonne. Um, so yeah, two factors to consider at lambing time. When you sell organic lambs to the factory, you have to declare every treatment that each animal had as an individual in the past 12 months. Now, most lambs are going to be less than 12 months when you sell them, so that means every single treatment since birth. Now, obviously, the aim is that they've had none or hardly any treatments. But if they do have any treatments at lambing time, it has to be recorded. So what we do on our farm is we tag each lamb as they leave the shed. They'd have a spray mark on them up until that point, spray mark in the crash, um, and then I would record the tag number beside the spray mark on, on my uh, manual kind of records. They later then go on an Excel spreadsheet in the house. Um, and tail docking and castrating, if you want to tail dock and castrate, you have to follow all the usual uh, rules like ours. They're usually done about uh, two or three days old when they leave their individual pen and they go into the creche. Um, but you do need a derogation for that. Shearing, we do that in May. And then um, around that time, the lambs are given their vaccination. Again, that's just for the clostridial diseases and pneumonia. Um, and then four to six weeks after that, they're given their booster, and they're usually foot bathed around that time as well. And it's a zinc sulfate foot bath that they're getting. We find that if we coincide the foot ba bathing with a treatment, um, by default, they get enough time in the foot bath. You can't just run them through that foot bath. They have to stand in it. So it's a batch foot bath that we have. Um, so I might stand them in that, give them their vaccine and their bolus at the same time, and then off they go. Um, 
we don't really have any problems with foot rot, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and then July and August, um, the lambs get their mineral bolus when they're weaned. If required, we can give worm treatments or coccidiosis uh, treatments. That would be based on a fecal analysis, and it would be done on an individual basis, and it would be recorded per tag number. You then, on, on my spreadsheet that I record all the, any treatments that the livestock had, um, I have a few formulas running so that I can keep track of withdrawals because um, we are looking at the organic standard withdrawal periods. So you'd have your statutory withdrawal, just take Albex as an example. Albex has a withdrawal, and it, I think, don't quote me on it, four days. Um, in organic, you're going to either be doubling or tripling that. Um, so worst case scenario, it's going to be 12 days. But then the factory, has its own requirements, and it's not the factory who's um, making up these requirements, it's the customers of the factory. And I believe for Albex it's 56 days. So you've got to be really careful and you've got to make sure you know the consequences of what you think you're going to use um, before you use it. And uh, I, in the early days, I'd often be seen going into my local agri store with a few sheets of paper, and <laughs> I just had to make sure that I was buying the right thing and, and not going to trip myself up. So onto grassland management. This is really important to us on our, our farm. We, um, we, we focus on it a lot. As I said already, we've got the mixed um, grazings. We've got red clover, white clover. Um, we're using temporary electric fences to split our paddocks when there's a sort of high grass growth. And that just means we can have the lambs moving on to fresh grass on a more frequent basis. That's helping reduce the worm bur burden um, in the lambs. The big benefit for us of using those temporary fences as well is because we are tillage farmers too, so all of our fields end up in tillage at some stage. just means we can take them up and it's much easier with going in with the machines. Um, the temporary electric fencing at the time worked out as uh, two euro per meter. And we have our multi-species swords as well. So the chicory is a natural antelmintic. Um, it should reduce the need to use wormers on the farm. And the plantain brings up minerals and um, el trace elements from deep down in the soil layer. It's got a really long tap root and it's making all these things available to the sheep. Um, the rotation as well, yeah. So I would aim to have our paddocks closed for at least three weeks before they're regrazed. But also we have this tillage grassland rotation, so that means some of our fields are left empty to three, three or four years. And like that's a huge benefit to us in um, keeping the field's clean. Then on to feed. Um, yeah, we've, we've all been saying feed is really expensive this year. Last year it was 690 a tonne. This is for a mixed ration, ready to go, 19% protein. Um, it's 830 euros a tonne this year. Um, we're not going to be buying it this year. We've fed in lots of different ways over the years. We started off in the first year mainly because I was nervous about getting it right. We started off with a U-nut, 19% um, protein. It was really handy, it came in little bags, um, but just too expensive, so we haven't done that again. The following year, we moved on to using straights, um, which was fine, um, probably the most cost-effective option, but it was very time-consuming and, and kind of messy, and we do both have off-farm jobs as well. So then we went into buying this ready-made, Ration, which was lovely, but it's just too expensive now this year, so we're going back to mixing our own straights. Fortunate enough that we have our own oats from our farm, so we'll be buying in organic soya and probably pea, organic peas as well to make it up to the 19%. The, the factory lambs this year have had nothing in terms of uh, feed supplementation. They've, they're just purely grass-fed this year. And... In previous years, they would have just got a few um, oats from our own farm late on in the season when we might only have maybe 10 or less left in any case. The rams don't get any feed either. We practice single sire mating on our farm. Um, I just find it's much easier on the rams. There's not going to be any injuries because of fighting. And what I would find as well, and I'm sure you will see it too, if you put two rams out in a field of 80 ewes, you've got your ideal ratio of one ram to 40 ewes but each ram is going to try and cover every single ewe in that field. So really, one ram is to 80 in that case. 
So we do single sire mating, but we do rotate them. Either the ewes get rotated or the rams get rotated, and at the end there might be some kind of mopping up when probably they're all tipped in any case, but we'd uh, just make sure, you know, just in case there was an issue with any of the rams. Um, oh, sorry, no. Just uh, at lamb and time as well. We're feeding at lamb and time, and in my opinion, this is how you would feed, whether you're organic or not. Um, now, I know some other people, some, you know, there is variations on it, but this would be sort of textbook, maybe. Um, so we start feeding the triplets nine weeks out from lambing, and they're gradually built up to um, from 0.3 of a kilo per head per day to 0.9 of a kilo per head per day. And then the twins, we're starting them off six weeks before they lamb, and we're starting them again on 0.3, per ki 0.3 of a kilo per head per day, and they work up to 0.6 of a kilo um, per head per day. And then the singles, they stay on 0.3 of a kilo per head per day, and they're only started two weeks before they lamb. Um, the ewe lambs are fed as well, but they're fed as if they're carrying one more lamb than they really are. And then onto our markets. Um, we have two main markets. We sell to Irish Country Meats in Camolan in Wexford through the Offaly Quality Lamb Producer Group. There's a 15% bonus on the quoted base price for organic lamb. Um, what else do I need to say about that? I don't know, so I'll move on to lack of organic lamb. Um, in 2020, I was on maternity leave and seemed to, I, I didn't really have any spare time, but I thought so I was sitting around, so I decided to open up sales that we were already doing on a very small scale to the general public. So we already kept lamb for our own freezer and for family and for a few friends as well. And I just said, why don't we make it available to anyone else if they want it? So I don't spend any money on marketing. I don't have a website. I don't pay for any adverts. Um, it's all through social media. There's Facebook page and Instagram page. There's a lot of repeat custom goes on there. Um, and I suppose that year from when we launched Laka Organic Lamb, all of our lamb went direct from that moment onwards. Um, that was that year. And then the following year was a 60-40 split, private versus factory. And now this year it's turned, it's more like 60% um, to the factory and 40 direct. And I'll happily hold my hands up and say I don't push the direct sales because I hardly have a minute to sit down. So, um, yeah, that's where we're at. So what next? Um, well, as I've explained, I'm working on improving the scanning rate just to where it was, just to have a, a, a decent, moderate um, scanning rate. And I'm doing that by keeping a lot more replacements uh, this past year and the year before. And I want to be in a position where I can call um, for age. At the moment, I'm only calling because there's been definite issues. Um, never for age. So 15 of my ewes at the moment are the originals. They're eight years old now. Um, kill out, yeah, I'm, I'm motivated towards the high kill outs. I want to get the lambs off the grass and away to the factory as early as possible. So that's my breeding strategy. And then I'm already starting to think about what uh, replacement ram will I use next. So when I've got those shapey rouge cross, cross beltex ewes, what ram will I put on them uh, next, but I don't need to know that until 2026, I think, so I'm well ahead there. Um, and that's it, I'll wrap up there.